Hey everybody, welcome back to Bible Fun for Dunce. Today we read Deuteronomy chapter 18, so let's get into it. Okay, so uh, it helps to just kind of take a big overview of this chapter. So this chapter actually points to three separate people, okay? So there are those on the inside, those who are on the outside of the community, and then one coming up ahead in the future. Now let's just kind of get into them. The first group of people that this talks about is the Levites. Now, a lot of people think that, a lot of people struggle to remember what the Levites are. So remember the patriarchs of Israel. There was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons became the 12 tribes. Joseph had two sons. Those sons were given equal billing with all the 12. So now you're looking at like, you're looking at 13. Well, God had set up their society for 12. So here's what he did. He pulls out one of the tribes, the tribe of Levi. That means that Levi was the son of Jacob. He was one of the 12 brothers. And Levi was chosen as his descendants would serve as the priests for the nation of Israel. Now, this is why this is important. Because only somebody in the family of Levi could work inside the tabernacle and eventually the temple and only one certain family from within that tribe of Levi could be the high priest. Now, here's why that matters while we're going into the promised land. Because where all the other tribes get land, Judah gets this land, and Simeon gets this land, and Naphtali and Dan, they're all being given portions of land. Levi is not given any allotment of land. Now, he's given cities all around where he can put his people. But as priests of God, these cities are centrally located so that they can be teachers and missionaries in the land that they're in. But they're not given land. Why? Because they're given something better. Whereas all the other tribes would be given land, the Levites would be given the Lord. Okay? So, ideally, the Levites wouldn't get an allotment of land because the Lord would be their home. So they wouldn't have a homeland. God would be their home. So they would serve him and it would be a privilege. He would, they would eat what he provided. They would be God's special group of people. Now, that's going to get them, if we get that right, then the community begins to kind of know the law because the Levites are faithfully teaching the law. That was the idea anyway. But then you come across verse number nine. It says, and when you come into the land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. So just like with Christians, these Israelites were supposed to engage in culture and tell people about God, but they weren't supposed to become part of culture. So they were supposed to take the good news of God to people, but they weren't supposed to adopt the lifestyle of those people. For instance, in verse number 10, it says, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. That's child sacrifice. Or one who practices witchcraft or soothsayer, or one who interprets omens or sorcerers. So the practices of magic, magic and sorcery in the land, that's the way the pagans live. These other nations were influenced by, they thought the world of the supernatural controlled everything. But at its core, Israel was supposed to know that God was the king and that God controlled things and God could not be manipulated. You couldn't have a powerful witch doctor who forced God to do whatever he wanted to do. People weren't in charge. God is in charge. Uh, listen, the, the idea here is, that when people don't know the Lord, they will often settle for poor substitutes. And what God is telling his people, he says, you don't buy into that stuff. You be different. Now, this is the section where Jack's got his takeaway. Jack's take it away for us. Okay. So, um, basically, um, uh, Moses, he wrote this, right? Moses did write this. Okay. So, um, anyway, so Moses, he's telling uh, these people um, not to engage in the sinful... Um, the sinful culture and the things that uh, the other pagan countries did um, because they're supposed to be different uh, and they're supposed to be like God. And um, God said not to do this, so they shouldn't be doing this because they know he's in charge of all of that. Sure. Anyway, um, so he's telling them not to do this uh, because um, they uh, hold up his reputation. They represent him 
and um, just like how God has um, like judged countries, well, judged the entire world before with a flood, this time he's using um, his own country, which is Israel. But um, in order to do this, like the Israelites, they can't be judging these people um, and defeating them for the same wrong acts that they're doing because that's hypocrisy. And so that kind of led me to uh, start thinking about the New Testament um, with Jesus. And Jesus said, um, don't worry about the speck of sawdust in your neighbor's eye when you have this big old wooden plank protruding from uh, your own eye. And uh, so um, that just made me think about that because of the hypocrisy in this. So we got to check ourselves um, before we start moving on to other people. That's good. Now, the most important section of this whole chapter comes in section number three, right at the very end. So from verses 15 to the very end, verse number 22, you need to write down in the margins, this is a prophecy about Jesus. So Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from the midst of your brethren. So Moses says that somebody's coming and he's going to do what I do. Well, what did Moses do? Moses stood between the people and God. Moses spoke to the people based on what God said, and then Moses prayed for the people based on what the people were doing. So Moses stayed kind of in the middle as an intermediary. As a matter of fact, a mediator is one who speaks to uh, people or God on behalf of the other. Right here where it says, from your brethren, means that when the Messiah comes, he would be not just human, but he would be a Jewish human. He would come from the brethren of him. I want you to notice what it says in that verse again. It says, And the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from the midst of your brethren, and you shall hear him. Do you remember what happened at the transfiguration? Or will be sweet and be kind and be nice. Do you remember what happened at the transfiguration when Jesus goes up on the mountain He's transformed in front of Peter, James, and John, and they hear a voice from heaven. The voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Other versions will say, hear him. Listen, that's the connection right here. A prophet like me from your midst, from the midst of your brethren, him you shall hear. Now, notice what, notice what else it says. Verse 18, And I will raise up from them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth. So, Jesus will speak for God. Notice this last piece. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. So, John chapter number 12, verse number 49. This says, this, remember, this says when the Messiah comes, he will speak. He shall speak to them all the words that I command him. So John chapter 12, verse 49, this is what Jesus says. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command to say everything I have said. I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who has sent me, I have said everything he has told me to say. So when you're reading through this, what you have to understand is the measuring stick for all prophets in Israel will be whether or not what they say is true. Which is why when Jesus comes along in the New Testament in John 14, 6, what does Jesus say that he is? He says, I am the way, the truth, truth and, the and the life. So the measuring stick of a prophet is, is what he says, does it turn out to be true? And what happens here at the very end of this, Moses is saying, there is one coming. Who is going to be? Who is going to stand between God and the people? He is going to be the mediator. He is going to speak what God says, and what He says is going to be true. And when He comes along, hear Him. Whatever you do, hear Him. That's exactly what we find whenever we find Jesus in the New Testament. I'm going to tell you: circle this part of your Bible because Moses is talking about Jesus. Now, listen. I have a, I have a question. I have a theory. Do you remember after the resurrection where Jesus, where two of Jesus' disciples are sad and they're walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus comes up and joins them and they don't know who he is. Mm -hmm. So they're on this journey. They're going to Emmaus. Jesus pulls up next to him and Jesus asks him, he goes, he goes, why are you guys so sad? And they go, are you the only person that doesn't know what happened? That Jesus of Nazareth, we thought he was a prophet. We thought he was the Lord and, and he's dead. They killed him and they're just moping all the way. 
And they, they, Jesus walks with them all the way. And the Bible says, and Jesus spoke to them and went back to and taught about himself to them from Moses and the prophets. What if this is the passage that Jesus preached to these guys about himself where they said, oh my goodness, we're not just walking with a person. We're walking with God. We're walking with the Lord Jesus. I think this is one of those passages. I think this is it. Circle this in your Bible. This is a good moment. All right? Listen, keep reading. We'll see you tomorrow in the Cities of Refuge in chapter 19. Bye. Bye.